to welcome everybody to the first session that will be examining Project 2025. Uh, Project 2025, as people know, is the policy document that has been issued by the Heritage Foundation that has created a great stir in the media. And what we will be doing over 10 sessions, examine it in detail. Um, we will talk today about the first part of the document, which includes the introduction and also includes the part of the document that deals with the issue of the executive branch. Um, and I will, uh, at some point, we'll open it up. People can ask questions and comment. We're all learning together about this. But let me just start with some general comments. First of all, the person who oversaw the uh, document was the uh, present president of the Heritage Foundation. His name is Kevin D. Roberts. Kevin D. Roberts is somebody who is uh, on record as looking at the 2020 election as essentially being uh, illegitimate. He also is seeing the role of the Heritage Foundation as institutionalizing Trumpism. Uh, and he's arguing that basically the Trump administration, with the best of intentions in 2017, got off to a slow start, but they did not implement their full agenda, and that must never be repeated. He's been quoted in various podcasts as essentially arguing for a second American revolution. That what he's talking about is we are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Uh, his comment uh, was, of course, attacked by the media, but that who is Kevin Roberts? Kevin Roberts oversaw this, uh, quite articulate. You can look and s look him up as you are studying the issue. Uh, now, what is the mandate for leadership? The mandate for leadership is about the seventh or eighth rendition of studies that the Heritage Foundation has started since 1980. The first mandate for leadership was a massive 20-volume, 3,000-page study done for Ronald Reagan that was done by the Heritage Foundation. And it's important to look at who actually was in charge of this operation in 1980. It was headed by a gentleman named Robert Heatherly. And Robert Heatherly was the president of an organization called the Inter... Uh, Inter... Uh, studies collegiate institute now what does that mean what that means is that this is an organization it was renamed uh later in its history uh this was an organization formed as the intercollegiate studies institute for individualists and it was formed in 1953 uh with kevin uh, with william f buckley as its first president it was essentially a bridging organization set up after uh, William F. Buckley became famous for his uh, work that he did, uh, God and Man at Yale in 1951. So this particular uh, institute uh, was essentially a right-wing think tank, a bridge to the old right, the pre-World War II isolationist right, uh, the conservative tendencies of the 30s and 40s. Uh, this was a response to their need to be institutional, uh, have institutional support. And through the 50s and 60s, the uh, Institute was renamed into the uh, Institute for uh, the study of, uh, inter basically Institute of the study, uh, uh, um, you know, ideas. Uh, and it was the driving force between the 1980 Mandate for Leadership series that was published by the Heritage Foundation. Now, ever, ever since... They, uh, they had uh, this particular uh, publication. Every presidential election has had a mandate for leadership published by the Republican Party, uh, the Heritage Foundation to support the Republican Party. And the, the correct name for the organization was the Intercollegiate Study Society of Individualists. It was renamed to be the Intercollegiate... Uh, inter, uh, uh, hold on a second. Jordan. Answer. All right. Anyway, excuse me. So this is the organization that is part of the advisory board for Project 
2025. It's sort of boilerplate conservatism, but I think we're going to get into the innards of this. Now, let's, before we go into the document itself, let me talk about uh, some of the issues that are raised by this. Now, we're obviously all aware of the fact that the past couple of weeks have been as volatile and tumultuous as any presidential election uh, all of us have seen since, of course, 1968. They're certainly comparing that uh, this year to 1968. Uh, the election was upended uh, by the uh, by the events of the assassination uh, attempt against Donald Trump, uh, the Republican National Convention. And then, of course, over the weekend, uh, last weekend, the uh, bowing out of the race by uh, President Biden and essentially uh, Kamala Harris uh, taking the front runner seat as the Democratic candidate. Uh, Harris has started to rebuild a more traditional Democratic coalition. Uh, there are more paths to uh, 270 electoral votes than Biden did. All the studies showed that Biden was losing all the battleground states. Uh, he was nine points behind in many of the uh, polling data, and it's somewhere showing that uh, Trump would probably get over 300 electoral votes if a election was held uh, in November. Also, the amount of money was drying up for the Democrats, another consideration to change uh, horses in midstream. Now, Trump is also, ironically in all this, more popular than at any point in his career politically. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. Trump has high popularity ratings, and especially among younger people. The decision by President Biden to resign is overwhelmingly popular in all the polling data. So that's something to, to just stress. Now, one thing important about this race, and we compare it to 2016 and 2020, is that in 2016, three states and 70,000 votes with the margin of victory for President Trump. In the case of 2020, it was three states and 40,000 votes that were the margin of victory for President Biden. Now, in both cases, they're fighting over a unified government. What I mean by that, is that uh, it's likely that whoever takes the presidency is going to take the House and the Senate. And uh, the amount of points in terms of uh, who is leading what is about 1% to 2% for each of the candidates at this particular point in time. Uh, another factor to keep in mind is that uh, we now have new states in play that weren't in play before. Arizona and Georgia in 2020 went over to the Republicans excuse me, to the Democrats. And we now have the possibility of Nevada uh, and other states being open to possible uh, control by the GOP in a race. So this is a different kind of race altogether. Now, some have compared, when have we seen a vice presidential candidate uh, do what uh, President Biden did? Well, it happened in the Korean War with President Truman. It happened in the Vietnam War with Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, in both cases, they pulled out of the race, they endorsed their candidates, and in, in the case of both of them, their candidates did not win. We know what happened in 1968 with uh, President Humphrey, uh, Vice President Humphrey, he did not win the race. It was a close race, but he did not win it. Uh, what is lacking in some of the analysis of this is that one can see, of course, the effect of the Gaza-Israel war on the Democratic Party. Um, people are raising the fact of, well, what's going to happen if we have a similar reaction to what happened in 1968 in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. So that's one factor to keep in mind in terms of all this. Um, the issue then is to turn to the document itself and look at it in detail. Now, the document itself is quite lengthy. It's 900 pages. Uh, so obviously, one does not expect everybody to have read the document, uh, and uh, as a sign, I've, I've or divided it up into different segments to read. But um, obviously, people, uh, you know, people, you know, it, it, you know, people are busy. It's hard to read it. But let me first uh, pull the document up so that people can actually look at it, and then we can uh, begin to analyze it uh, for what it says. Now, it's a quite a uh, lengthy document, it's a provocative document, uh, and I'm going to start with the introduction. Um, now, here's the introduction. I remember, Kevin Roberts is somebody who is a uh, basically a uh, election 
denier. Uh, a uh, he uh, he considers what happened in 2020 illegitimate, and um, and some of what we're seeing here is not dissimilar from the kind of rhetoric we see in the Republican Party for the past uh, 30 to 40 years. So, um, for example, he talks right now, our political class has been discredited by wholesale dishonesty and corruption. Look at America under the ruling and cultural elite today. Inflation is ravaging, family budgets, drug overdoses, deaths continue to escalate, and children suffer the toxic normalization of transgenderism, the drag queens and pornography invading their school libraries. Overseas, a totalitarian, totalitarian communist dictatorship in Beijing is engaged in a strategic cultural and economic war against America's interests, values, and people. All while global elites in Washington awaken only slowly to the growing threat. Um, and he talks about uh, the uh, what I mentioned earlier, that again, it's not unusual for a Democratic or Republican uh, political movement trying to seize power. The third power, party uh, parties do the same. They come up with an agenda for what they want to do when they're in power. But in this particular case, um, this is volatile in the sense that we have a different kind of situation politically in the United States. The kind of divisions and arguments that made were made in the 50s and 60s when people would say there were really no differences between the political parties, if you ever look at studies of political alienation, they always talk about you're dealing with Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Well, now you really do see differences between the mainstream parties as to what they advocate. Uh, and that is why this becomes an important document to dissect. Now, there are four broad fronts that they're arguing about uh, in this document. Uh, these are sort of vision statements, and we can talk about this. Uh, they want to restore the family as a centerpiece of American life and protect our children. <laughs> they want to dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American people. They want to defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. And they want to secure our God-given individual rights to live freely, what our Constitution calls the blessings of liberty. Now, let's see what they mean by this in detail. So the next conservative, this is their proposition one. We'll talk about this coming out of this. Their first proposition is the president must get to work pursuing the true priority of politics, the well-being of the American family. And he makes a comment, the entire point of centralizing political power is to subvert the family. And he makes an argument here that government exists to essentially weaken the family and essentially defeat it as an institution. And he cites uh, social data, American families in crisis, 40% of all children are born to unmarried mothers, including more than 70% of black children. There's no government program that can replace the whole child's soul, cut out by the absence of a father. Fatherlessness is one of the principal sources of American poverty, crime, mental illness, teen suicide, substance abuse, rejection of the church, and high school dropouts. Uh, so this is an important issue to actually base policy around the question of preserving the nuclear family. Now, what does he say attacks the idea of the family? Today, the left is threatening the tax exempt status of churches and charities. They reject woke progressivism. The next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke cultural warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender diversity, Diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, and any other term used to describe Americans of their First Amendment rights out of federal rule, agency, regulation, contract, grant, regulation, and piece of legislation that exists. They attack pornography uh, as a uh, issue that must be suppressed. It has no claim to First Amendment protection. Uh, the question of schools. Schools serve parents, not the other way around. So they argue that uh, there should be universal school choice, choice. Now, they'll get into further detail down the road in the document as to what they mean in terms of policy prescriptions. They, of course, attack the noxious tenets of critical race theory and gender ideology. They should be excised from the curricula in every public school in the country. Um they argue that uh, 
the Thro family promises expressed in this book and central to the next conservative president's agenda must go much further than the traditional narrow definition of family issues. Every threat to family stability must be confronted. Um, they talk about uh, the question of Roe v. Wade. They celebrate the uh, overthrow of Roe v. Wade. Uh, overturning Roe v. Wade as a decision that for five decades made a mockery of our Constitution and facilitated the death of tens of millions of unborn children. But the jo Dobbs decision, the Dobbs decision uh, basically negated Roe v. Wade. This is just the beginning. Conservatives in the states and in Washington should push as hard as possible to protect the unborn in every jurisdiction in America. So that's proposition number one. Uh, which they go into further detail throughout this document. Proposition number two, dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American people. Now, this is something we've heard. This is, you know, libertarianism, hardcore conservatism, all these different strands that form the ideology of the Republican Party in its modern era. But <coughs> they argue here that the, the task of reattaching the federal government's constitution and democratic tethers calls to mind Ronald Reagan's observation that there are no easy answers, but there are simple answers. In the case of making the federal government smaller, more effective, and accountable, the simple answer is the Constitution itself. So they get into this whole question of interpreting the Constitution and the question uh, that we've seen debated by the Federalist Society and other institutions uh, that get into, is the Constitution a literal un uh, a document to be taken into consideration or is it one that's a evolving live document, uh, which evolves, which, of course, uh, I and I'm sure all of us feel. Uh, they feel that the present process is out to empower the party elites that uh, secretly negotiate without public scrutiny. So the term administrative state refers to the policymaking work done by the bureaucracies of all the federal government's departments, agencies, and millions of employees. Under Article I of the Constitution, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of the Senate and the House of Representatives. So the bureaucracy itself is, in their interpretation, a inimic is, is, is against the whole question of separation of state. Uh, they feel the bureaucracy should be eliminated because it's unconstitutional. That's their interpretation. So uh, they're talking about the need to essentially eliminate. Here they make an example of the unelected and elected bureaucrats at the EPA who strangle domestic energy production through a difficult to understand rulemaking process. Bureaucrats at the Department of Homeland Security. Bureaucrats at the Department of Education who inject racist, anti-American, ahistorical propaganda into America's classrooms. And then they also complain about the woke bureaucrats at the Pentagon who force troops to attend training seminars about white privilege. Uh, unaccountable, they associate all that with unaccountable federal spending. So that, of course, is another great trope in the Republican dialogue about unlimited spending. We have to control this. The bureaucracy just spends for itself. This kind of argument, which we're all familiar with in terms of the uh, arguments made in the past uh, 50 to 60 years, certainly since the defeat of Goldwater in 1964. Uh, the most egregious regulations are coming out of one place, the Oval Office. The president cannot hide behind the agencies, as his many executive orders make clear. His is the responsibility for regulations that threaten American communities, schools, and families. So, they want to have an executive branch clear all this out immediately. Uh, and they talk about that, as we will see later. Uh, and they talk about the left's institutional power. It's sort of amusing the way they, uh, you know, will talk about, you know, what to me is sort of, you know, normal bourgeois liberal politicians. They're, quote, the left. But anyway, uh, the as monolithic, as monolithic as the left institutional power appears to be, it originates with appropriations from Congress and is made complete by a feckless president. A conservative president must look to the legislative branch for decisive action. So what's important about all this and why I stress the issue of a unified government, unified government means you not only take control of the executive branch, but you have the coattail effect of taking control of the Senate and the House 
and you sweep the gubernatorial elections and you even go downstate into state legislator slate legislative elections and further down into local elections in municipalities around the United States. You're talking about a sweep like Reagan did in 1980. That's what they're aiming to do. Uh, the other issue they raise is about national defense. Now, they have a special section about that. I will have to supplement that with other reading as we go along because foreign affairs of all times, I mean, one of our, our colleagues in Pacifica pointed out with me with great amusement. It's the first time I've ever seen articles by people defending Trump in uh, foreign affairs, which have indeed started to happen and I think are interesting for people to look at. They will further get into the question of um, of, of, of how this affects foreign policy. But uh, the next conservative president must end the left social experimentation with the military, restore war fighting as its sole mission, as if that isn't the mission right now, and defeat the threat of the Chinese Communist Party as its highest priority. And uh, this is, again, this the ruling elite becomes, you know, Trump can, as a multi as a multi-billionaire, can run around uh, talking about how he doesn't represent the ruling elite, but he's fighting against the ruling elite. And we know that's part of his populist identification with the public. Now, let's go to Proposition 3. Defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. Uh, so, of course, they state the uh, kind of questions that come out in uh, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. The government, the United States belongs to we the people. All government authority derives from the consent of the people, and our nation's success derives from the character of its people. The American people's right to rule ourselves is the obverse of our duty. We cannot outsource that to others, our obligation to ensure that conditions allow our families, local communities, and churches and synagogues and neighborhoods to thrive. Okay, that sounds reasonable. However, uh, to most Americans, that seems like common sense. But then, of course, they get into this whole question of the centers of leftist power, like the media and the academy. This statement is a basic civic is branded as hate speech. Progressive elites speak in lofty terms of openness, progress, expertise, cooperation, and globalization. Uh, instead, they believe in a kind of 21st century Wilsonian, of course, referring to President Woodrow Wilson, in which the enlightened, highly educated managerial elite runs things rather than the humble, patriotic working families who make up the majority of what the elites contemptuously call flyover country. Now, that, of course, is a good allusion to uh, the vice presidential uh, candidate, uh, J.D. Vance, his book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which uh, basically talks about that issue and it's a legitimate issue the fact of how many americans in rural america are ignored in by to some extent the liberal and left uh, elements in our society i there, there is that argument to be made however what we're doing here is we're sort of seeing that uh, this they're arguing that this wilsonian hubris so of course they go back to uh, woodrow wilson's arguments for the league of nations uh etc uh, sort of an idealistic vision of uh, world order that was essentially thwarted uh, by a uh, conservative uh, House and Senate after the First World War. Uh, they talk about here how today near every top tier university president or Wall Street hedge manager has more in common with a socialist European head of state than the parents at a high school football game in Waco, Texas. And that's actually pretty entertaining, that kind of comment. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So they want to change this. They want to reject uh, organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union, supranational organizations like the United Nations and the European yeah. Union are to be rejected. They're, uh, they want to reject uh, international treaties on everything from pharmaceutical planet, patents to climate change, the rights of child children. They want to eliminate those. Uh, this is, uh, again, they associate with the woke left. Um, and they also will argue that today's progressive left so cavalry supports open borders despite the lawless humanitarian crisis their policy creates along America's southern borders. They seek to purge the very concept of the nation state from the American ethos. And here's where you talk they see in terms of here's you get into they don't talk about this, but you get into these issues of replacement theory, that is these more reactionary racist ideas that uh, open borders is essentially out there to replace uh, white voters with uh, non-white voters. Uh, and this is something that is argued in Europe, which has affected domestic politics in European elections. We see this going on in France and Germany uh, in particular. 
Uh, but we see this also in the United States. Um, and they attack environmental extremism. They consider that to be decidedly anti-human. Uh, Jim? Uh, yeah, no, Jack, let me finish this first. And then um, let me finish these propositions, then we can get into this. Uh, the same goals are the heart of elite support for economic globalization. They have this whole thing about uh, you know, attacking their notion of globalization, uh, which, of course, we know that it's attacked from the left point of view, except with different kinds of uh, assumptions. Uh, they talk about how the rise of big tech, uh, which is a tool of China's government. That's sort of interesting. Uh, they argue that. And, of course, big tech is involved in the uh, present election. Look at uh, Elon Musk and uh, Peter Thiel, of course. Uh, Peter Thiel is the person who employed uh, J.D. Vance who is the vice presidential nomination uh, nominee. They talk about China uh, and uh, basically international organizations agreements erode our constitution. Uh, and so this is a whole argument that, again, people should read. Ah, and here they talk about the need to ach achieve, essentially eliminate any kind of controls on energy, uh, you know, carbon emissions. They, are, they, they later will, you'll see, they want to knock out that completely. Uh, full-spectrum strategic energy dominance would facilitate the reinvigoration of America's entire industrial and manufacturing sector as we disentangle our economy from China. So their idea of a foreign policy is one that would be, uh, you know, forget about global climate change. We're just going to frack away. Uh, and they talk about, as you know, uh, bur you know, uh, drill, baby, drill is one of their big mantras. And finally, this is the fourth and last proposition. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, their idea of the pursuit of happiness, they argue that this should better be understood as the pursuit of blessedness. Now, what do they mean by that? That is an individual must be free to live as a creator or a so We're talking about political philosophy here. Uh, they think of uh, uh, pursuit of good life is found primarily in the family, marriage, children, Thanksgiving dinners and the like. The American public was founded on, on principles prioritizing and uh, maximizing individuals' rights to live their best life or enjoy what the freedom is called the blessings of liberty. Now, the rich and powerful have hated – that. It's interesting to make this jump to say the elites hate uh, the idea of liberty in our society, and they argue here that um, their idea of the blessings of liberty – is a set associated with a rejection of uh, slavery, of uh, second-class citizenship for women, mercantilism, socialism, fascism, communism. Uh, they uh, assert that when the average person makes these assertions, um, this is, again, pure Americanism in their mind, but uh, they are essentially saying that the left, Marxist elites, uh, that they will attack essentially argue that this should be negated by government control of the economy, which basically uh, will not be the solution. So this is sort of a uh, interesting idea of essentially a free market argument, which we've seen them argue for many times uh, in the past as a sort of a tenet of conservatism in American culture. Uh, they finally argue here about uh, how the uh, United States policy should, again, uh, they attack people as being socialist elites, their opposition, which of course is ridiculous, uh, is in my mind ridiculous, but nevertheless, that's sort of a demonizing dirty word for those who oppose them. Um, and they talk about uh, the need to have pro-growth economic policies that spur new jobs and investment, higher wages and productivity. Um, so that is the propositions that they argue. And at this point, let me stop. Uh, you're listening to the first session of a study group on Project 2025. My name is Jim Dingman. Uh, we are talking about the first sections of this study, which deal with the introduction. Uh, this is the introduction we just went through. And we're going to talk about the other parts of the study that deal with the executive branch in power. So does anybody have any comments or ideas they want to share about this so far? Just raise uh, your Jim, hand. I yeah, have a question. Uh, I have yeah. an observation. Uh, yeah. I, I find uh, 
these types of uh, 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 proposals, they, they call for individual freedom, but they deny other people individual freedom. Very, very much the uh, contradiction in their own terms. Uh, but I also found it very curious that they're going to they're going to start telling people uh, anti-science things because they can't refute science. Uh, anything to say about how they're going to get scientists to go along with their anti-science messaging? And I mean, a there's a third thing, which is the idea that many of the uh, uh, computer people, many of the IT people, I should say, uh, are very much right wing. Uh, because they know full well that the Chinese are not necessarily going to sit back and let them take over the world of, you know, artificial intelligence and American-made uh, 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 computer chips. And, any comments about those three points? Those are good points. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I think we'll see that as we get further into this, uh, that they, uh, the anti-science aspect of it are quite interesting because they talk about essentially destroying the EPA the entire Environmental Protection Agency, and they, of course, uh, fly against the internationally accepted common consensus about dealing with international climate change. So, yes, indeed, there's lots to be explored in this document as we get further into it. But thank you for those comments. Anybody else want to say something about this? Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, go on, uh, Michael. Michael Novick, hi. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you have to read a little bit through the uh, – uh, the rhetoric that they choose to use to describe things, but uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, when they're talking about uh, the administrative state, they're talking about um, particularly any kind of regulations that have to do with the call the great awakening and wokeism, uh, which they see as the the current uh, uh, you know socialistic or communistic uh, you know left control, and so what that's about is. Uh, has to do with uh, internally in the United States dealing with questions of racism and sexism. And uh, the, when they talk about the family, they're talking about a particular form of the family, which is a patriarchal uh, white Christian family. They don't put it in that terminology, but that, that's, the, that's really what's uh, there behind there. The same thing when they talk about uh, globalism, if you read through their stuff, they, you know, they basically say that uh, the big tech and uh, the administrative state are essentially they see as having spent the last several decades strengthening what they define as communist China. And uh, again, behind that is, uh, and if you look at the stuff about the, uh, you know, domestic security and, and, and the military, they're basically preparing for war with China and, and seeing that the United States has no kind of uh, has to sever its relationships with China so that it can be in a position to fight it. And I think that we need to really be very clear about uh, what's behind this. It's not just some kind of libertarian, you know, a small government. Uh, that's the rhetoric they use to, to, to talk about these things. But it is about uh, white supremacy. It is about male supremacy. It is about imperialism and militarism. Yeah, those are all good points, Michael. They they make it pretty explicitly clear about these kind of questions as they move along in the document. And I will bring in uh, down the road specialists on China who can talk about this issue in greater detail. Uh, anybody else have other comments before I move on? Sally or Claire or Robert? Yeah, I put a bunch of comments in chat. Um, one thing I noticed was the phrase ordered liberty, which I do not understand. Um, and also, they talk about families and fathers. And so let's stop incarcerating so many black and Hispanic and, and other people of color, fathers of color, especially. You know, that's how you preserve the family. <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. I mean, it gets back to, you know, you think about the, you know, sort of the arguments of social policy in America, going back to the Moynihan Report of the late 60s which uh, caused all sorts of controversy when it was implemented. I think uh, Daniel Moynihan, when he became uh, part of the Nixon administration, the whole question of patriarchy and the issue of matriarchy in the black community was one that was quite, they designed social policy around that. And, uh, and you're right, the issue of incarcerated people is a very important issue that uh, is not really addressed with this, uh, as we'll see as we go along. I mean, it's sort of, these are the things that they exclude completely. 
Um, but yeah, great, great comments. Anybody else want to say something about this? Yeah, Michael. I want to add something because I, I just got, got to look at the chat. I agree with what Sally said about uh, particularly uh, Hillbilly Elegy and Vance. I mean, if you, I, I haven't read the entire book, but I, I, I skimmed it and I looked at, you know, his explanation about the book. And basically, it's it's blame the victim. He 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 portrays all the the ills that that uh, he sees as you know poor white uh, working people in Appalachia as suffering as being their own fault for not having. Uh, devised an effective strategy. He specifically says he rejected, he was attracted to, but rejected the argument that it's a, a consequence of, uh, you know, globalism and, and, and deindustrialization. Uh, unbelievable argument. He makes them basically, uh, it, it's it, the amount of self hatred, I think, that's wrapped up inside there is quite interesting. And, and uh, you know, I think could be drawn out in relation to, to his relationship with Peel. And, and just they talk out of both sides of their mouth about big tech because they're totally into the uh, surveillance state and uh, and Teal's role with Palantir and the rest of it. So you can't take yeah, that. Again, again, very good points, Michael. And the issue of deindustrialization is one which I will be I, – I'm glad you brought that up because, of course, the policies of deindustrialization and handling that, you could say – Republicans forget about it. they're completely out to lunch, but the Democrats are not that much better in terms of the way they've handled deindustrialization yeah. since the 1970s, and particularly how it affects these parts of the United States. So this is really interesting stuff for us to contemplate. Sally, go on, Sally. Yeah, uh, direct comment on, on that book. I made the mistake of bringing it up on a uh, your email list and got blasted by somebody from Appalachia who was absolutely horrified by that book and any, <laughs> any reference to it. It's, yeah. uh, Jim? Yeah, go on, Jack. Uh, what Michael and Sally are saying is really kind of the contradiction that they, they sell everybody. Uh, not only do they not represent what happened in Appalachia, honestly, nor do they represent the uh, family as being, you know, only a white family will do, Sally. Uh, uh, they don't like black families, as you probably uh, recognize, because they don't really value families if it's black families. Uh, and then the final thing, I, I believe that what Mike said is really kind of true. Uh, the, the, the selling of, of contradictions wrapped in, in, uh, in uh, 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 political posturing uh, 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 smacks of uh, white nationalism and Christian uh, fundamentalism because they want to, you know, impose rather than uh, 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 have a government of people. They want to have a government of only certain people. And and just one comment about that that uh, hillbilly elegy thing. Uh, I believe that what was said was true. That they they tried to uh, 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 figure out what was wrong with the Appalachian uh, 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 lifestyle, circumstance, uh, situation in the modern America. But it's not just, uh, you know, uh, science. It's not just uh, uh, high tech. It's not just uh, 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 energy. It's not just uh, 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 all these other areas of, 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 of dumbing down and, 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 and handing it over to the elite. They want to hand it over to the elite. The point is, is that the elite is not the people that are living in Appalachia that will benefit from voting for these people. So they're trying to sell a, a pig in a poke, as the saying goes, or maybe they're putting lipstick on a pig, if you like that phrase of a, uh, otherwise. But but in reality, what this is, is really nothing more than just kind of putting the putting the hood on the on the uh, 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 the, the the image of there's something wrong with America. And uh, we're going to blame it on those elites, not these elites. And we're going to hold them responsible, not those responsible. We like this family, not that family. It's a it's a bait and switch. Uh, if you if you think about it from the point of view of there's many things wrong with America. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I read a book about what they did to the in the banks in 2006, seven and eight. And one of the things a gentleman gives you at the end of the book is the idea that there's going to be a thirty five trillion dollar deficit. Uh, caused by war and and not paying for it and borrowing money to to justify things that we can't account for. Is there any mention of any of that? That we're really kind of running on borrowed time in this uh, wonderful American exceptional uh, <laughs> uh, contradiction. <laughs> well, that's a good question. We'll explore that because I don't know how this issue gets into questions of political economy. Claire, did you want to say something? You you wanted to jump in there, Claire? 
I, I just, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have any answers, but I have so many questions about everything that you, that you said and, and just, you know, agree with all the other speakers, but like, you know, I, as I was listening to you speak, Jim, so much of what, what you were conveying was that they feel this, they feel that, you know, the, I, that's the thing, like they don't have the, all of these premises and things that they're the, you know, solutions that they're offering to all of the problems in America is just based on opinion. I, I, I just don't <clears throat> ever see any evidence that any of these, and, and they really, and sometimes they don't have real policies other than destruction. It's just <clears throat> destruction. It's not a true, it, you know, and of course there's probably more to learn here, but you know, on, on the surface, it's just such a, it's not a fact, none of these are fact-based arguments with evidence and, and science and, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, examples from other countries that draw, you know, could be drawn upon to, to solve some of these problems that we have in America. And that's, what's so frustrating. It's just based on their hatred of what's currently there or hatred. There's so much intolerance, you know, like there's only one way to be instead of America, which is the melting pot. You know, they, they just Ugh. are completely denying that. So just more of a comment than a question. Thank right. You. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. learn. And I think what I did do is I went through lots of websites. I sent out a document uh, which will uh, deal with a specific analyses of all their propositions. There's a lot out there. People have been reacting to Project 2025. But let me at this point continue to go through the document. And what you're listening to is my name is Jim Dingman. We are conducting a study session on Project 2025. We're going through the first part of the book. Uh, first, uh, basically 90 pages. Uh, we hopefully will have time to talk about the part of this that deals with Pacifica in particular, uh, which Michael Novick uh, brought to the attention of all of us. Thank you, Michael. Um, but let me first go in further into the document itself. So we're starting to head now into the part of it that is really interesting, talking about the executive branch. Now, some of this is boilerplate. For those of us who know about uh, political science, I was actually trained as a political scientist many moons ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not necessarily known by everybody. And it's important to talk about how they want to actually implement their takeover of the executive branch, uh, which is what their aim is, and use that to transform the government and the society of our country. Now, here they talk about the actual taking over the government and they talk about here they divide america into two opposing forces this is i'm quoting them woke revolutionaries and those who believe in the ideals of the american revolution now i actually am somebody who come from family who fought the american revolution so this abuses the hell out of me anyway the former believe that america is and always has been systematically racist and it is not worth celebrating and must be fundamentally transformed largely through a centralized administrative state they later believe in America's history and heroes, its principles and promise, and in everyday Americans and the American way of life. They believe in the Constitution and Republican government. Conservatives must fight for the soul of America, which is very much at stake. Then they quote James Madison, Abraham Lincoln, um, talking about the situation in 1860, where the greatest threat to America would not come from without, but from within, of course, the Civil War. And uh, they talk about... Um, the need to have uh, control of the executive branch. Uh, they quote the former director of the OMB, Office of Management and Budget. He writes a chapter, chapter two. The modern conservative president's task is to limit control and direct the executive branch on behalf of the American people. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. That is from Article 2 of the Constitution. And that particular sentence is the subject of much controversy. This is the basis of people arguing for a unitarian interpretation mm -hmm. of the power of the executive branch, uh, sort of what we saw manifested in a decision by the Supreme Court in the past few weeks that essentially grants uh, President Trump, ex President Trump, immunity from January 6th. Uh, that's an extension of the unitary. Uh, power 
an interpretation of the executive branch that it's sort of the executive power of the president uber alles, over everything. Uh, that is how, uh, for example, Eileen Cannon, uh, the judge down in uh, Florida, has interpreted throwing out the case in Mar-a-Lago, the documents, and I'm sure that that will be argued in further screwing up the case in Georgia uh, that Fannie Willis brought in her use of the RICO statue in Georgia, and they're obviously trying to use that to overturn the decision in uh, New York, uh, particularly over the Stormy Daniels case. Uh, they're uh, in, in invoking ex- immunity and executive privilege of the uh, president. Now, um, they're talking about here, this is an introduction to this uh, discussion. <coughs> they're talking about the necessity to have political appointees must be given the tools, knowledge, and support to overcome the federal government's obstructionist human resources department. More fundamentally, the new administration must fill its ranks with political appointees. Now, that is something that is commonly looked on as a lesson learned from the first Trump administration. They didn't come in there completely prepared to take over the federal government. This document is one designed for that purpose. Uh, the Much of this will be dealt with in the, the chapters to come. So I am going to go right to the actual chapter itself. Now, this is a description, this sort of boilerplate about the White House office, and I will talk about this in general terms, uh, but this is a description of the power of the executive branch, the executive office of president of the United States. Uh, And it stresses how uh, the uh, president is supported in his uh, office by direct staff officers, and that these are chosen by the president to serve at the pleasure of the president. And remember, we had all these controversies when Trump decided to choose, for example, the Secretary of State, or uh, he chose um, uh, General Kelly, uh, and he had all these problems with the people that he considered, quote, disloyal to him. Uh, And what we're talking about here is to make sure that this doesn't happen again uh, for a second Trump presidency. Now, he talks about the importance of the chief of staff. Uh, The chief of staff basically oversees the National Economic Council, the Diplomatic, the Domestic Policy Council, and the National Security Council. And here they're talking about these are very important to basically have controlled by political appointees. And further in this chapter, they talk about the need to basically expel all the people who are attachees from the State Department, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Defense, et cetera, and get them out of there and replace them with loyal political appointees to the Trump agenda. They want to further in, enforce the power of each of these uh, executive branch bodies by not only having the uh, political appointee in charge of the NSC, the National Security Advisor, the Domestic Policy Council, and the National Economic Council, uh, that they want to ensure that that person is loyal, but they want to further subdivide it and make sure that they have presidential appointees that are deputies, and they want to further subdivide that with appointees that will oversee oversee parts and the functions of these basic uh, executive branch agencies. And so a lot of this is uh, sort of boilerplate. They want to make sure that the deputy chief of staff uh, of uh, management and operations and policy are indeed uh, people who are political appointees loyal to President Trump. Uh, they talk about deputy chiefs of staff for management and operations. Uh, all these people are appointees, deputy chief of staff for policy. These have to be political appointees who are conservatives, who are vetted, and who will serve the president's interest. They talk about senior advisors, uh, such as czars, policy czars. If you recall General McCaffrey, uh, he was made the drug czar. All these people have to be vetted and put under the, um, the ideological uh, filtering uh, of being nominated for these positions. The Office of White House Counsel, remember John Dean was a White House Counsel. So uh, they want to make sure that they have a person who's in the Office of White House Counsel who will uh, basically be loyal and will implement the agenda of President Trump. 
and the agenda they lay out in this document. Um, this is, again, you can read it. Uh, the staff secretary, uh, this is a person who's not particular. This is a person who's essentially uh, a, uh, a filter for people coming up to the uh, POTUS, uh, President uh, of the United States, to give him uh, ideas to come up with him. And this uh, staff secretary also has to be loyal uh, to uh, Trump. The Office of Communications, this is the press. This is the person who's in charge of, uh, you know, conveying uh, presidential uh, propaganda, if you will, to the public, holding, uh, you know, press briefings, etc. They want to make sure that, that that person, Huckabee, of course, Huckabee's, uh, uh, Huckabee was in charge of that. And we've seen other people. Uh, these people, of course, will be on, uh, you know, MSNBC. They'll be on Fox. They'll be on CNN. They will uh, have media uh, careers after they leave the White House, but they want to make sure that there's a coordination of communications to the public. Uh, Office of Legislative Affairs. This is a party, a position that was created by President Eisenhower. This is a very crucial uh, position that deals with Congress. So you want to make sure that you have a uh, person in that position, again, who's loyal and who will communicate uh, the uh, legislative agenda to the House and the Senate to make sure it's implemented properly. And you want to make sure the staff in there is loyal to the president. Now, they get into this issue here, which is very interesting, the Office of Presidential Personnel. Now, here's where they get into this question of political jobs. So they talk about here uh, the PPO, the Office of Presidential Personnel, must fill approximately 3,000 political jobs. Uh, and you usually will see that there will be uh, large gaps in these jobs that aren't filled, but they want to make sure that this is taken care of from year from day one. When the president comes in on January 20th, he fills these jobs up for the political appointees who are vetted and who are committed to implement his policy. Uh, they want to knock out, uh, identify potential political personnel by fielding resumes. They want to vet them. Again, this is not abnormal. This happens all the time. But here they are learning the lesson from the first Trump administration. They want to make sure they have complete ideological conformity in all the political appointee jobs that they have. Uh, and so they want to make sure that the Office of Person Presidential Personnel is completely on board and ready to put in several thousand appointees. Now, they have another Office of Political Affairs. Uh, this uh, coordinates uh, presidential uh, political interests. Uh, it will deal with questions of uh, assisting with a campaign if the president will monitor congressional campaigns. Of course, they want to make sure that that office is also ideologically pure. Uh, the Office of Cabinet Affairs, I mean, we're going breaking this down because a lot of people don't know this about the executive branch. Uh, the executive branch has a Office of Cabinet Affairs. This is an office that will coordinate cabinet meetings with the president. So the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, etc. They want to, of course, abolish the uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary. But this is an important role that coordinates uh, cabinet members. And again, they want to have ideological conformity. The Office of Public Liaison. This is a sort of a PR office for the presidency. It goes out and mobilizes every aligned social, faith-based minority and economic interest group. So this is a very important political lobbying group for the executive branch. They want to make sure that is also uh, well-coordinated and led by people who will be, as they say here, the chief White House enforcer and gatekeeper among these various interest groups. And then they have another office of intergovernmental affairs. So this particular office coordinates uh, all the relations with non-federal government entities, state, county, local, and tribal governments, a very important part of the executive branch coordinating policy down to local levels and state and county levels. Uh, now, the White House Policy Councils, these are the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and the uh, Domestic Policy Council. So they want to make sure that they're all working in synchronicity. They want to make sure that there's policy coordination, policy advice, and policy implementation that are coordinated by all of them, and they want to create, and here's where you get into the layers of how they want to control it. They want to create in each of these bodies or revitalize policy coordinating committees in each of these 
councils, the NSC, the NEC, and the DPC, and they want to make further deputy committees that further monitor what's going on and principal committees. So they want to have layers of political appointees in each of these parts of the executive branch that will have sort of uniformity in their implementation of policy. So they describe here the NSC, the NEC, uh, and the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, now, they have, of course, the Office of the Vice President. Uh, the Office of the Vice President is a tie-breaking position in the Senate. As we know, uh, Kamala Harris did not show up for Netanyahu last week. A very interesting signal. She did not participate. So there's interesting distancing going on between her and the policy of, of President Biden. Uh, they also, the Office of the First Lady and First Gentleman, that is a policy office that also is used vigorously. We've seen, of course, the most important person in the 20th century was Eleanor Roosevelt. She really made that a very important uh, position. And that was a, a, a policy uh, position as first lady that she used vigorously in association with her husband uh, by having people go out and monitor the New Deal being implemented. So that can be done in a first lady or first gentleman office if is so chosen by the president now they get into uh here the actual executive office of the united states in detail but let me stop right here does anybody have any comments or questions they want to make and you're listening right now to the first of 10 sessions that will deal with the project 2025 my name is jim dingman we're talking with our colleagues in pacifica and elsewhere any comments about what I've just read or talked about concerning the executive branch? Jim? Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, go on, Michael. Uh, so um, I guess a couple of things. One, again, is I think you can't just take them at their word. I mean, this is extremely granular. It's very interesting analysis of what goes on inside the White House, you know, beyond the stuff that you would see on, on uh, West Wing or one of those TV shows, that, you know. Um, I do think the critical uh, points here, uh, the, 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 there's a history they don't really talk about, but this goes back to McCarthyism. It goes back to who lost China. It goes back to the struggles, uh, you know, quote unquote liberals in the CIA. Uh, and they don't, they don't spell that out, but that's what they're dealing with. They're thinking about uh, cross purposes. If you read the paragraph about uh, the NSC in particular, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's in this thing, but it says uh, the NSC, NSC staff and principal should work in tandem with the National Economic Council. No, where is it? Is that the right one? No, here it is. The NSC should take a leading role in directing and drafting thorough review of all formal strategies, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the nuclear posture review, the missile defense strategy, etc. In particular, the national defense strategy, which by tradition has evaded significant reviews, should be prioritized. The White House review by the NSC and the Office of Management Budget both should be conduct reviews for operational war plans and global force planning and allocations with the Secretary of Defense to align themselves with presidential priorities and review all key policies. Again, this is about putting them on war footing much more clearly. They are interested in having nuclear primacy. They're interested in being able to wage and win a nuclear war. They're interested in war with China. You have to understand what's behind this. It's not just administrative gobbledygook. It's a particular set of policies they want the president and the power to implement and to carry out. The same thing, they do talk about the uh, budget, Office of Management and Budget, and they raise what, uh, I forget, the person talked about that. The deficit, they say, is a $33, $33 trillion, uh, you know, uh, debt. Uh, but their strategy for that is uh, basically they want to defund everything but police and the military uh, and the carceral state and the, and the military industrial complex. They're not going to put that in this document because they're pretending it's about procedures and techniques. But you have to read between the lines to what they're actually about. All right. Thank you, Michael. All good points. Sally, go on, Sally. Yeah. Um, for someone who hasn't been too deeply involved in, in knowing how the presidential office works, it's quite interesting. For an organization that says it wants small government, they got a heck of a lot of layers in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Anybody else have comments? Uh, Jim? Yeah, go on, Jack. Uh, I remember when uh, the uh, daughter of the ex-president was uh, was uh, put into the position of advisor to the president, and the son-in-law was put into the position of uh, international affairs uh, with the Mideast, uh, Israel. Uh, they didn't want them vetted. Now, I always had the assumption that this was because they were they were going to do do uh, illegal or nefarious or you know un unapprovable things or things that may not be. Uh, uh, wanting to be shared with the general public uh, when they, you know, broke some eggs or, you know, uh, stepped on toes or, you know, told people uh, this is what we want and we don't care what you care about. Uh, and I also think that the uh, uh, when when uh, uh, when we say China, 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 what 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 part of that? And, and I and I don't mean to disagree with Mike, but I, I think part of that is to create a bogeyman so that they could, you know, throw things at it and make it seem like we have this problem in America because uh, we're, we're, we're trying to find a reason uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to justify why we're failing. And, and uh, I, it's like I told my brother, the reason why uh, everybody hates Anthony Fauci is probably because they don't want to admit that America really failed at taking care of public health. So the, 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 uh, uh, as Sally just said, it's, it's, a, it's a contradiction to believe that America is both elite and, and capable and uh, small government when in fact it's a big government that uh, wants to tell you what to do in your bedroom and uh, wants to tell you what to do with uh, you know these other nations because they're they're doing things that we don't like and we're not able to get our people to to come to up to speed to what they're doing we're, we're losing ground internationally that, that, right. that I think is part of the reason why they they try to put a a, a, a a sheet over the ghost. Here they are trying to tell us that you know America's got this and this and this going on, but you know, and then they try to bring in uh, uh, unvetted uh, uh, ministers into the government uh, uh, agenda because they don't want you to watch what they're doing, or they don't want you to question them when they get get the office. Right. Well, actually, later in the document, uh, pertaining to that question of how they vet people. They actually talk about how they want to take control of the vetting process yeah. to prevent situations like that happening in the future. When, of course, they raise the question of what are the qualifications of uh, of Kushner to be in the position he was in? Because he was a uh, uh, an advisor, if you will, uh, in this executive branch uh, structure I just laid out. And he was essentially negotiating uh, foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East with the Abraham Accords and all the other things he was doing. But um, they have other examples where people would not pass uh, uh, reasonable uh, security checks, and they want to make sure in the future that that is not a obstacle. But I'll get to that later. Does anybody else have any comments to make on this? Uh, uh, I, I had one other I wanted to make, but I also wanted to respond to what was said. I, you know, I, I think, uh, again, behind all this is they are grappling with certain realities in the world that they don't want to talk about but it is a reality that BRICS is now a more substantial part of the global economy than the g7 and that's that's a fundamental shift in economic realities underlying the the, the threat that they see china as posing because china is the central china and secondarily india are central to the power of the BRICS. so yeah, those are very uh, important are about. the other thing I, I just want to point out is what they say about the White House Counsel. This is really critical. The White House Counsel's office, no, sorry, the Office of White House Counsel also serves as the primary gateway. This is the, the president's lawyer. That's what the White House Counsel is. The Office of White House Counsel also serves as the primary gateway for communication between the White House and the Department of Justice. Traditionally, both the White House Counsel and the Attorney General have issued a memo requiring all contact between the two institutions to occur only between the Office of White House Counsel and the Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General. The next administration should re-examine this policy and determine whether it might be more efficient or more appropriate for communication to occur through additional channels. The White House Counsel also works closely with the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel to seek opinions on matters of policy development and the constitutionality of presidential power and privileges with the Office of Legal uh, 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 Counsel and the DOJ Office of Legal Policy on presidential judicial nominees. Again, you have to cut to the chase of what they're talking about. 
They want to exert even more direct presidential control right. over the FBI and over the uh, judicial nomination process at, at, at every level. Uh, you know, this is about the consolidation and centralization of political power and the use of those agencies in which there's supposed to be a firewall between the political purpose of the president and the administrative function of the agency. And I'm not making any case whatsoever. The FBI, I want that to be clear. I want to go back to one other thing about this too. We cannot, uh, obviously this is just study and discussion and Pacifica does not have a, 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 a policy as it, but it, uh, the, uh, Wilson, for example, there's no way to, to uh, nothing Wilson, it was defensible. <laughs> Wilson was an imperialist. Wilson was a white supremacist. Wilson uh, rebuilt the Ku Klux Klan, literally. His, his, his former college roommate wrote the book, The Klansman, that was the basis of the film Birth of a Nation, which was used to actually recreate the Klan in the buildup to World War I. Wilson created the Federal Reserve. Wilson took us into World War I and uh, you know, created the beginning of the national security state and the global em you know, empire that we have. So I think in terms of dealing with this, you have to be very clear that we're not defending the shit that they're attacking. We're attacking it from another direction. Yeah, very good point. And of course, Woodrow Wilson, um, his famous comment when he saw Birth of a Nation, it's lightning made as history. Uh, but that's an interesting uh, aspect of this. Does anybody else have any comments before I move on? Uh, Michael Bressler, you joined us. Uh, Carolyn, Claire, uh, Rob, you've been surprisingly silent. Does anybody else want to jump in before I move on? Going once? Okay, I'm going to move on. All right. So let's talk. I, about I, I wanted, wanted to say, I'm sorry, yeah, it's on. just completely tangential. The guy who wrote this uh, chapter on the executive office of the president and very central to the whole thing is named Russ Vaught, V-O-U-G-H-T. I don't know if anybody uh, watches uh, The Boys, but it's this uh, 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 series on Amazon Prime about superheroes uh, trying to take over the United States from within. And the company that does it is called Vaught. It's kind of a, some kind of combination of sort of Disney and... and uh, 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 X, you know, uh, uh, Musk. So I, I don't know if they knew Vought when they picked the name, but the, the whole thing is kind of a parable for Trump. And uh, I, I was struck by the fact that uh, there is an actual Vought that you know, because they're constantly talking about uh, Vought in, 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 in as behind the scenes, uh, you know. How well, let, me, let me before uh, Michael is here. Uh, let me just before I bring Mike Pressler into it. Uh, Russell Vaught uh, was the director of the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, for, for from July 2020 to January 2021. But after he left the White House, he founded an organization called the Center for Renewing America, which is focused on combating critical race theory. Uh, and he identifies himself as a Christian nationalist who seeks to infuse the government society with elements of Christianity while having a commitment to an institutional separation between church and state, but not the separation of Christianity from its influence on government and society. Uh, he has was the executive director and budget director of the Republican Study Committee. He was the policy director for the Republican Conference of the United States House of Representatives, and he was a legislative assistant for U.S. Senator Phil Graham. Uh, so that is uh, Mr. Vaught. But Michael, did you want to say something, Michael Bressler? Well, uh, yes, um, I, I had to join this a little bit late, but I really appreciate this discussion. And um, I just want to point out, if it hasn't already been uh, pointed out, the obvious um, uh, connection uh, between uh, what Trump said, was it yesterday or the day before, about uh, before this Christian group about, well, just vote this election and you won't have to vote after that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, that uh, was a obviously, um, <laughs> you know, you know, knowing Trump, you know, this could be, you know, anywhere from BS to uh, 
um, reality and probably some, in, you know, a whole lot of interconnection. Um, but the thing is, this does make, uh, as my, Michael was pointing out, um, the concentration of power within the executive branch um, much more, uh, you know, centralized and untransparent um you know when i first uh, heard of this and i got some uh i got to catch up to speed on this but when i first heard of it kind of made me think of the commissars in the mm. you know uh, um you know in, in the communist government um spreading the word and ensuring that uh policies were implemented in the way that the higher ups wanted it to be um and gaining their own power in the meantime and i i i would like to just um uh well i i would hope that um not only will we be discussing this but this will be the basis of some sort of program that we can put on our stations that um will make uh more public uh, the the these various aspects of of this project. Yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do here mm -hmm. uh, today, uh, Mike. Uh, let me continue then uh, with what we're talking about here. And again, what we're doing is this is the first session of a series of ten sessions that will deal with Project Twenty Twenty Five. They'll be going on twice a week. Uh, so one will have to read this kind of stuff <laughs> for the next uh, few weeks. And uh, my name is Jim Dingman, and I'm going to continue with what I'm doing right now, which is talking about the first section of the book, which deals with the executive office of the president of the United States. Now, um, you know, he sits here. This is Russ Vaught, who I just identified uh, is in charge of a think tank that essentially was attacking critical race theory. We can deal with that another time. I'm sure all of us are very familiar with the critiques of that. Uh, and the great challenge, let me get to the, cut to the chase here. The great challenge confronting a conservative president is the existential need for aggressive use of the vast powers of the executive branch to return power to the American people. That is what he writes. A president who is willing to lead will find in the executive office of the presidency, EOP, the levers necessary to reverse this trend. That is the trend that he argues that the power of the people has been broken by this executive branch and the uh, inability of it to break the bureaucracy. Uh, they need to have boldness to bend or break the bureaucracy to the presidential will and self-denial to use the bureaucratic machine to send power away from Washington and back to America's families, faith communities, and local governments and states. So he starts with talking about the power of the Office of the Management and budget omb u.s office of management and budget it is a essentially an ability to control the actual money going into the various uh, agencies uh in the government and it can uh enforce the president's budget it can management agency and personnel performance procurement policy financial management and information technology it can develop the president's regulatory aid agenda uh, reviewing new regulatory actions and reviewing federal information collection and setting and enforcing federal information policy. In other words, these are things that can be done by the executive branch issuing executive orders without having to go through the legislative process of fighting it on Capitol Hill and coordinating and clearing agency uh, communications with Congress, including testimonies and uh, views on draft legislation. Now, the director must view his job as the best, most comprehensive approximation of the president's mind as it pertains to the policy agenda, while always being ready with actual options to affect that agenda within existing legal authorities and resources. He must ensure that the OMB has sufficient visibility into the deep caverns of agency decision making, the quote, deep state, end quote. Now, here we get into the kernel of what they are talking about in terms of shifting the executive branch permanently. One indispensable statutory tool to that end is to ensure that policy officials, the program associate directors, PADS, who manage the vast research management offices, RMOs, that's how the OMB is divided up. 
they personally sign what are known as the apportionments. Now, what they are talking about here is that the vast majority of these apportionments, that is the assignment of tax dollars through the OMB, have traditionally been signed by career officials. These are deputy associate directors, and these are generally professionals. They are career civil servants people. Trump, in his first administration, changed this to be in the power of program associate directors who are political appointees. Uh, Biden reversed this. So what they want to do is go back to the program they had under Trump with the power to supervise the actual disbursement of funds through the resource management offices. They want to ensure that those are political appointees loyal to their agenda. Okay. Again, that's not unusual, but now they're actually, if you take it in the context of this entire document, we're talking about essentially a, essentially a counter revolution, a reactionary transformation of the U S government of profound dimensions. Now, the most important offices for moving OMB at the will of a director are the budget review division and the office of general counsel. They want to make sure that those people are directly attached to the policies of the Trump agenda. Uh, and I think earlier, uh, Michael had gotten to this point. He was talking a little bit about these different parts of it. Uh, the director should empower a strong deputy director with authority over the deputy for management. The, uh, pre the program associate directors of political appointees and the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs to work digitally to, digital, diligently to break down the barriers within OMB and not allow turf disputes. So in other words, they want to make sure that there is one OMB that's working with the fiscal goal of, of the president. They want to go into the six resource management offices. Now, those are management offices that take the actual budget recommendations and put them through the ringer, if you will. Now, all these RMOs are the following. National Security, National Resources, Energy and Science, Health, Education, Income, Maintenance and Labor, Transportation, Justice and Homeland Security, Treasury, Commerce and Housing. <coughs> they want to make sure that these particular RMOs are led by loyal program pads and they want to have deputy pads program uh whatever the hell this term is uh program associate directors they want to have deputy program associate directors who are loyal to their agenda and they want to make sure that these are political appointees that are uh vetted and uh ideologically attuned to the kind of conservative revolution they want to implement uh they talk about the management office of the OMB, the M side. This includes the following offices that are led by presidentially appointed Senate confirmed individuals. So you have these various offices of the OMB, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, the Office of Pers Performance and Personnel Management, OPPM, the Office of Federal Financial Management, the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer, and the Made in America Office. Now, each of these offices uh, play a critical role in how the policy is developed. Uh, but again, the one thing they emphasize here is they want to have control in particular of the Office of Performance and Personnel Management so they can ensure that they have control of people coming into these offices. And they describe the different functions, the OFPP, the Office for Federal Procurement Policy. That office creates a critical role in leading the development of new policies and regulations concerning, uh, concerning federal contracting and procurement. The Office of Performance and Personal Management. That office helps direct uh, federal agencies to establish their performance goals and performance review processes. That, so that's important to set the goals of what they want to do in terms of implementing their agenda. The Office of financial of Federal Financial Management roots out uh, waste and fraud and abuse. And the Office of uh, Federal Chief Information Officer essentially de deals with internet technologies, basically new technologies. Uh, this office here, the uh, Made in America office, uh, this is an office that is a, a Trump administration creation. And uh, basically, uh, Biden has expanded its power 
to deal with Buy America and more Made in America commitments. Now, uh, the these are sort of examples of how they want the different offices to function. And one would have to go research what these executive orders are, uh, the OMB circulars are, et cetera. But what essentially they want to do is uh, basically make sure that these regulatory uh, teams and functions implement the kind of regulatory process that Trump wants to implement, which is essentially to dis basically dismantle uh, federal, state, and uh, uh, regulations that deal with uh, commerce. Uh, the next president should strengthen and implement the Information Quality Act. Uh, the use of uh, other acts are to be eliminated. Uh, the un And then the executive of reforms and actions are not enough. Congress must act. The next president should work with Congress to pass significant regulatory and process reforms, which go to a long way to reigning in the administration, administrative state. So they want to pass a whole bunch of other measures to further weaken uh, the federal uh, s system. Uh, the National Security Council is also to be part of this. And they essentially want uh, now the and I've, I'm more familiar with the NSC. I've read many, many documents historically. The NSC, uh, the NSC is to work in tandem with the National Economic Council, et cetera. Michael, what was your comment or question? Michael Bresler. No. Bresler. Michael Bresler, you raise your hand. Mike. All right. Let me let me continue. Uh, if you have a comment, please uh, don't hesitate. Yeah, go, Michael. Go on, Michael. Yeah. So uh, I, I, this goes back to some of the other questions about science and stuff. I, I, I think, uh, again, uh, you, you, we can't miss the forest for the trees. So they go to great detail. But he, 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 here's like a couple of critical sentences. Uh, uh, as a general matter, the new administration should separate the scientific risk assessment function from the risk management function, which is the exclusive domain of elected policymakers and the public. The next administration will face a significant challenge in unwinding policies and procedures that are used to advance radical gender, racial, and equity initiatives under the banner of science. Similarly, the Biden administration's climate fanaticism will need a whole of government unwinding. So again, behind all the nitpicking about who's in charge, there is a, a, a policy and a, a strategy that they're trying to make sure they can carry out. And that is, it's not necessarily anti-science, but it is about the application of science to technology and the application of technology to the war making. It's, it's, you know, it's like uh, Trump is very effective at saying, Drill, baby, drill. That is the essential message of it. They want to protect. Uh, they specifically talk about not uh, allowing uh, 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 you know control of the uh, uh, policy uh, in the hands of, of you know uh, the, uh, that's behind this idea of risk. In other words, it, if if the scientists see too much risk in something, they still don't want that to affect so-called risk management. Uh, I, I understand why you're going through the details, but I think it's critical to understand what's behind, uh, you know, this, it's not exactly a smokescreen. It is, it's the implementation techniques of all this stuff, but they're not, they're not going to spell out to you, except in these occasional paragraphs, what they're really about. And I think it's critical that we understand what they're really about. All right. Good points. Michael Bressler. Go on, Michael. Michael Bressler, you have to unmute. I was, yeah, those were uh, basically the points I wanted to bring out. That um, uh, behind all this, obviously, there's um, this attempt to um, sort of hide the science, or, or at least um, uh, put it in a certain track, as as we've seen. In, in many instances, such as climate change, um, you know, in, in different contexts. That's a very good point. Now, let me... Uh, let Jim? Me, yeah, but hold on, Jack. Let me just get into... Before I before you come in here, Jack, let me just point these two things out here. Uh, <clears throat> this is a direct quote from the, the document about the National Security Council. 
The National Security Council should rigorously review all general and flag officer promotions to yeah. prioritize the coal core roles and responsibilities of the military over social engineering and non-defense matters. In other words, they want to make sure that according to their uh, way of thinking, a general and flag officer could, should not be promoting climate change, critical race theory, manufactured extremism, and other polarizing policies that weaken our armed forces. Then further down in this document, they make a comment here that the national security, uh, the national security advisor uh, should return all non-essential detailees to their home agencies on their first day in office so that the new administration cannot can proceed efficiently without the personnel landmines left by the previous stewards as soon as possible should replace all central detailees with staff aligned to the president's priorities. In other words, they want to just get anybody out there. They don't want another Alexander Vindman. They don't want to repeat that again. They want everybody out of there who could possibly be a whistleblower. But go on, Jack. What was your comment? Uh, just basically, the uh, uh, they, they, they're working backwards. Uh, uh, if you think about the risk from smoking a cigarette and the way in which they misled people for so many years, taking risk apart from science is the reason why they want to do it. Uh, right. it, it. It's really not a problem in this country because we have people that accept the fact that, you know, we deserve bad health care because that's what happened during the pandemic. Uh, that's why so many people just think that the vaccine is dangerous and they don't criticize the government for not providing them with universal health care. Uh, we, we have a, a population that not only accepts uh, the, the, uh, the misleading uh, statements made by uh, these types of uh, ideas, you know, energy is really important, but we don't really want to stop uh, coal and, and oil from uh, making trillions of dollars because, you know, we really don't know the risk involved in destroying the planet's climate. And that really kind of relates to the fact that not only is the uh, policy a, a, a two-faced or double-talking or, you know, uh, uh, a bifurcated uh, thought process uh, based upon we, we see that there's no risk, therefore we have no responsibility. But it also adds to the idea that we're being left behind by the rest of the world. Uh, Mike, my comment about uh, China is not that China is not a, a risk or a threat. Uh, more likely that they're going to put up a, a, a bogeyman to make it so that they can look like they're doing something when they try to kind of mislead people into thinking that, you know, we, we could we could wallow in our own failures and continue to wallow in our own failures. And I can give you five examples how we constantly fail the American people, whether it's the fault of the Congress or the the, the president really is insignificant to me. But I believe that we we really have this ex exceptionalism going on that's really not exceptional at all. It's really just a just a, a, a manipulation of information to make people think that, you know, because uh, w we were successful maybe 50 years ago and we're still running on the, uh, the, the benefits, uh, you know, but uh, uh, why would I buy an American car anymore? They're not really well made. They're bad products and the government right. bails them out. And, you know, here I am buying a Chevrolet. What am I, stupid? I have to, I have to. My my computer brother talked me out of buying Chevrolet. He says, oh, buy a Toyota. And I'm saying to myself, but I'm an American. I don't want to buy a Toyota. And you're the conservative. So anyhow, the point is, is what I said. Uh, uh, we we don't really have an enemy in China. What we have is an enemy in our own bad understanding about how we respond to policies. Our Congress is broken. Our government doesn't function in terms of real problems that the people of this country. Oh, and there's one more point. Uh, uh, and this is really not directed at uh, uh, Michael. It's directed at Jim. How could elite people attack elite people? Because these are elite people attacking elites. Who are the elites that they're attacking? You know, <laughs> thank you. Well, they have contradictions among themselves. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, yeah, well okay, that, and those are good points. Uh, I'll have to mention that to friends of mine who work down there in the in the executive branch. They'll, they'll get a kick out of that comment, Jack. All right, so in here, of course, they're talking about the National Economic Council. They want to have uniformity uh, with all the different the coordinated uh, bodies that we've got dealt in detail. Uh, they also, it's interesting here, they talk about the Council on Economic Advisors, which provides the president and the White House with the latest economic data and forecasts. They want them to be in synchronicity with uh, all the other aspects of the executive branch, particularly the National Economic Council. Now, they talk about the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Now, this, of course, is a very consequential uh, position that we will see in every administration, the Office of the Tr U.S. Trade Representative 
Uh, this deals with the China issue. And that's why I'm going to bring in people who are far more informed about China issues than I am to talk about this. But they're talking about here the failure of the WTO to discipline China for its abrogation of its trading commitments has seriously undermined its credibility and made it a less, less effective institution. Uh, we'll get into this uh, in greater detail uh, as we go along here. Uh, now, the Council on Economic Advisors is talked about. This was created after World War II uh, in 1946. And uh, we know that this has a, an interesting impact on the stock market, on the economy. When the Council of Economic Advisors hand out uh, their reports, we know how important uh, various uh, chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors have been. Uh, but they want to make sure that the uh, Council of Economic Advisors is less of a, quote, neutral body, which, of course, we can question whether that's it, uh, it, it, how's it functioned historically, but they want it to be integrated into the other aspects of their policy in the executive branch. Now, the National Space Council, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. We know that Trump made a big deal about sending up the Space Force, and they want to make sure that space policies are essentially coordinated uh, with the, and interesting that the vice president uh, normally has been dealing with the U.S. space force and space policy. Um, and so that's an interesting aspect that they want to make. This is sort of part of their discussion here. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, another uh, in, instrument of the executive branch created in 1976. That's another important aspect of uh, the policy to be talked about because look at the internet, look at the issue of AI. This is going to be where uh, organizations like this do indeed have great importance. Uh, and uh, that's another instrument of the uh, federal executive branch. Then, of course, the Council on Environmental Quality. Now, in this particular environment, the Council on Econ Environmental Equal of, of Quality, the CEQ, they basically want to weaken it or dissolve it. That's the gist of this argument here made. They want to eliminate the interagency working group on the social cost of carbon which is at this point co-chaired by various uh, executive branch agencies, including the Council on Economic Advisors, the OMB, et cetera. They want to eliminate that. And I don't have to tell an audience like this, the question of the social cost of carbon is something that everyone uh, who listens to uh, the kind of shows that are done on Pacifica radio stations are quite familiar with. Then they want to deal with the question of Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, that is uh, perhaps boilerplate but they're making a big deal about this in terms of its interrelationship with the border. Uh, this is another aspect. And they want to eliminate the Gender Policy Council. That's to be eliminated. Uh, they want to abolish it because it promotes abortion. It promotes comprehensive sexuality education. And it is basically a purveyor of, quote, the new woke gender ideology. Now, the office of the vice president they basically want that to be more or less kept the way it is. He's a member of the National Security Council, has his own economic advisors. Uh, the vice president is tasked with certain initiatives. Uh, he uh, is essentially, some. remember Richard Nixon went off to Venezuela and is chased out of Venezuela in the 1950s. They're about ready to send the Marines down to get him. Uh, the vice president uh, serves as a, a brand ambassador for the White House, uh, travels abroad, uh, and that's that part of the uh, – executive branch of the United States. Now, how are they going to manage uh, the various personnel agencies? This is where they get into this question of basically replacing them with appointees. So uh, here they talk about several agencies that manage personnel. The Office of Personnel Management, the Merit Systems Protection Board, the Federal Labor Relations Authority, and the Office of Special Counsel. Now, to cut to the chase on this, the uh, we're talking about the Merit Systems Protection Board is essentially the lead adjudicator for hearing and resolving cases and controversies for 2.2 million federal employees. Now, we know that the most, the largest percentage of unionized labor now is in state and federal government positions. So what this really works out to is that they are essentially trying to uh, overthrow several decades of legislation that deals with the question of civil service and protecting it from uh, capriciousness. And what they essentially want to do is weaken all these laws and basically uh, strengthen 
the Office of Merit Systems Protection Board. They want to do that because they want to introduce performance uh, measurements that would force the uh, federal bureaucracy to come under private scrutiny. They actually talk about eliminating jobs because they're too high in the public sector as opposed to the private sector. And they're basically talking about breaking unions. Uh, so that is where this and, and this, they, the centrality of performance appraisal, one can read that. Uh, but essentially, the gist of it is how there has been a strengthening in legislation and in uh, executive branch decision making that strengthened the ability of the federal bureaucracy to function. So they complain about how there's greater pay in the federal bureaucracy, more vacation time in the federal bureaucracy than the private sector. They want to eliminate that. They also want to eliminate the ability of people to appeal. They talk about how most of the appeals when they try to fire people are over equal employment opportunity, EEOC uh, cases. And they talk about how there are 42,000 EEOC cases when they're trying to fire somebody. So people will appeal to the EEOC. They want that all concentrated in the MSPB because they feel that the MSPB tends to rule for the bosses, if you will, to use a labor term. And they want that to be uh, where the adjudication of uh, complaints about uh, basically, um, you know, the boss is, you know, I'm not performing well, et cetera. They want that to be adjudicated in that particular area. And they also want the bureaucracy to be replaced by contractors. So this is a whole system and argument to essentially knock out the federal civil service. Uh, they want to have enforced rifts, reduction in forces. Uh, they want to know, they want to cut through the 2 million uh, federal employees. And they also want them to operate under the same uh, rules that they do with federal contractors. Federal contractors are less expensive. They don't have the same kind of uh, benefit packages that an employee of the federal government has. They want to eliminate all that. Uh, they have identified over 100 actions that the executive branch can take to implement these kind of measures. And they talk about all these different kinds of studies done by not only conservative think tanks, but liberal think tanks like Brookings, it talks about the need to have more efficiency in the federal uh, system. So that is the gist of this first. Um, oh, yeah. And they, they are very angry about the union representation of uh, workers. They feel they go back to they even quote FDR. They say that this is basically something that shouldn't happen. And they want to make sure that this is eliminated. And they cite all these executive orders, uh, executive order 13836. Uh, 13837 and 1839 that basically were aimed to eliminate, implement this under the Trump administration. They were revoked by Biden. They want these things reinstated. And they want to make sure that the um, ranks of the federal bureaucracy, when they implement these measures, are fully staffed by political appointees. That would be their idea of a reform bureaucracy. Go on, Michael. So a couple of things. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, again, they're grappling with certain contradictions in their own thinking and in realities, but they're, they're, uh, they're very clear about a couple of things. One is really about the, the uh, continuity between the two parties on a lot of these things. So in this section, they talk about uh, Carter and Reagan. They say, uh, uh, Carter came in basically criticizing that uh, uh, all government employees were rated as successful. Carter fulfilled his campaign promise by hiring somebody who was the first uh, chair of the Civil Service Commission and then uh, director of uh, uh, one of the offices. And they changed the structure so that uh, paying benefits were based on improved performance. They say time ran out on Carter before his act could be fully executed, so it was left to Reagan to carry it out. Uh, it says, overall, the new law seemed to work for a few years under Reagan, but the Carter-Reagan reforms have dissipated within a decade. Uh, they, when they go back to the, we were talking earlier about the space stuff, they talk specifically about the fact that uh, all the space initiatives that were begun, including the Space Force and some other stuff under Trump, 
have been continued under Biden. So they're they're actually less concerned about the partisan stuff as they are about the permanent state apparatus that implements it. I think that's something we should be clear about as well, that the, the shift in, in administrations from one party to another doesn't necessarily affect this as much as they would like you to think. But I, I think the contradiction you're dealing with is that, again, behind a lot of this is uh, a push towards privatization. Right. And, and they're not going to spell it out as clearly, although when you get to, if we do get to talk to, about the stuff about the CPB and Pacifica, basically their strategy for uh, public radio is that public radio should be eliminated as a commons and force it right. to exist within the marketplace. The same thing with the space stuff. Their, 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 their strategy for space is complicated because on the one hand they see it as a military sphere of operations on the other hand they want to rely almost entirely on private uh, enterprise to carry out the space exploration and and uh, they 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 see the need for the state and yet they hate the need for the state and they want to direct it primarily towards uh what can the state do to empower the you know the private enterprise interests that they're involved with so um uh, you know, again, I think you have to like kind of uh, filter a lot of what they say, you know, through what's really behind it. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, any other comments before I move to the final aspect of what we're going to talk about today, which is the CPB? Anybody else have any comments to make about this? Hey, uh, right. I'll say something, Jim. Yeah, go on, Bob. Uh, first, I want to... Uh, for your other listeners who don't know me, are going to pretty soon accuse me of violating Godwin's law. Uh, I, I do have a, a PhD in modern European history, specializing on the uh, Germany of the World Wars. But uh, I just wanted to say that in 2016, uh, after I picked my jaw off the ground and uh, <clears throat> quit looking around for stray dogs to kick you know, to work out my frustration, I tried figuring out, you know, what the heck this Trump thing was all about and, and trying to sort of excuse friends of mine who voted for him, you know, try, try, trying to figure out WTF, could this happen? Somebody I like and know and respect could do that. And, you know, I, I read some books and, um, you know, talked about the poor left behind people in the flyover states and, um you know how they um, the the dot com revolution bypassed them, um, even though that was thirty years in the making, and you know these guys stubbornly held on to to being uh, you know fifth generation buggy whip manufacturer or whatever. You know, just kind of self inflicted wound and self pitying uh, BS. You know, but I tried I tried to be kind of sympathetic to it um and then you know, you know it, it sort of went on um in 2020 and 2024 you know it's 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 kind of getting uh worse it seems to me and it's uh, uh january 6th really made it hard for me to uh further excuse these people and just kind of look the other way and say yeah well it's too bad you were left behind and too bad you're in a flyover state and too bad you couldn't adapt from, you know, a non buggy whip world or whatever to now, you know, it's, it's not so much about this poor left behind trope of uh, hillbilly elegy. You know, now it's just willful destruction of democracy in this country to me anyway. And um, you know, somebody, or I guess this document here was talking about how the uh, a CEO of a of a modern company has more in common with a quote unquote socialist European than they do uh, a football fan at a high school game in Waco, Texas. You know, and I mean, <laughs> yeah. what a what a divisive phrase that is. You know, and right. and we all know that Waco, Texas is is a dog whistle name yes. of all of all the towns in this country where they could talk about watching football and uh, you know someone in the stands you kidding me you know branch davidian town you're gonna right. pick that one you know 
And so um, it's, it's just crazy. Uh, and, and to think that uh, Mr. Flyover State buggy whip uh, manufacturer guy puts all of his faith in this New York real estate huckster. And this, <laughs> this guy is going to look out for his interests. And this guy cares about him. And this guy cares about the country. It's like the, you know, uh, he, he, he's the equivalent of the failed artist in Vienna, right? <laughs> and um, how's this guy going to save you? But how's it? He, he's, I call him the world's stupidest man. You know, he knows nothing about anything except he knows one thing, and that is how to exploit fear and division among a certain demographic in America. He doesn't know anything other than that, right? And uh, he went from looking out for these little guys in 2016 to now he is the one guy in the whole nation who can fix anything. I can fix it all. And this is where, you know, my Hitler uh, comparison really hit stride is that's exactly the message Hitler sold the German people, that he could fix Whatever the problem, the Versailles thing, the depression, whatever they got, he could fix it. Don't ask me how, because I'm going to pull it out of my ass, you know, but uh, just trust me. Just trust me on this one. Uh, I can fix it. <laughs> and it's just incredible. Uh, it's, Rob, you just nailed it. Well, I hope. Go ahead. Th thanks for saying that. No, I, no. <laughs> I was going to say. I was I, I was going to say that these sad people that don't understand uh, one of the comments that that book I, I read last month uh, pointed out was that the number one thing that they could do for America right now politically would be to fix broadband all across the country. Everybody that doesn't have broadband uh, because it gives you freedom to get information. Maybe yeah, but they don't want to get information. Oh, I know that. <laughs> That's why I said you nailed they it. Want they want they can pull those they information want Trump, and bring them to recognize that. It, they, know, want, they want Trumpler to do their thinking for them. Right, right. And they, uh, don't, they don't, I don't need to know anymore. I don't need to know anything more than Trumpler has my best interest at heart and he will succeed. And I just need to turn, you know, to get smaller government, bullshit. They want bigger <laughs> government, but they want it all under Trump. You know, yeah, exactly. In, uh, I would in, in the Third Reich, this is called coordination. Yeah. That means you don't just have the Staten Island Chess Club, it's got to be the Staten Island National Socialist Chess Club, right? You know, right. and it's the same thing now. We're going to call it the Staten Island MAGA Chess Club. And if, if you're not uh, a MAGA uh, guy, you can't be in our chess club. Uh, and we'll just throw you in jail. I mean, it's 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 gonna uh, it's gonna get that way eventually. With a, you don't need to have any more than one more election. Yeah, uh, Rob, I would I would just add that it also happened in Italy with Mussolini. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I well, would also say that uh, Jim, the idea about being anti-union is because unions can be a powerful force. They may not be right well, now. But they can be All a right. powerable force. All right, let me let me let me yeah, finish so, with this. Let me. My yeah, I'm sorry. I want to say something that actually follows up on that because I think it's critical in terms of the appeal they make, which is towards resentment of people who actually have one game. So uh, I want to. Uh, you you were talking about the uh, uh, OMB and all that stuff. They talk. One of the things they want to instantly say is market based pay and benefits. And uh, they, they claim that the government is supposed to match the market, but actually it exceeds it. They say a federal employee with five years experience receives 20 vacation days, 13 paid sick days, and all 10 federal holidays compared to an employee at a large private company who receives 13 days of vacation and eight paid sick days. Federal health benefits are more comparable to those provided by Fortune 500 employers with the government paying 72% of the weighted average premiums. But this is much higher than for most private firms. Uh, almost ha uh, most private plans, almost half of private firms do not offer any employer contributions at all. So what they're trying to say is, if you have a problem, the problem is that the people who actually have won decent benefits are who you should be aiming your anger at, as opposed to the corporations that have denied you fundamental 
uh, you know, health care and, and decent uh, uh, vacation days. I, you know, I have a granddaughter who lives in Sweden. They get uh, two months of parental leave that can be divided between the mother and the father paid. Uh, you know, the, the, the level of social benefits in this country are, are absurd. And what they want to do is blame it on people in government who are getting something not even that good because it's better than what most private employ employers provide and that most private employees get, and they're trying to stimulate that kind of resentment and target it at big government. Well, what it's about is driving people down to the lowest level across the board. So, you know, again, you have to look at what they're really about. They're about, when they talk about, uh, again, one of the things I, I pointed to later is, is they attack the uh, um, uh, SBA loan that we got because they say that that uh, when there's a, a, a disaster loans uh, in effect, it reduces people's incentive to purchase private insurance. That's because they're coming out of the the, the fire section of the, the finance insurance, uh, real estate. You know the people that are really ripping everybody off, but they're going to disguise it by you know blaming government for the problems that they're actually creating. Sally, you had your hand up before I go to Carolyn. Go on, no, Sally. Not, not that much. Just basically, yeah, it's backwards. We should be uh, pushing the government to match the public or better, not pulling down the, the public benefits. I mean, geez. All right, Carolyn. Yes, thanks. Uh, this is a, a little bit off topic, but uh, I'm concerned about the fact that uh, there are not more people listening to this, and I'm hoping that after this is over, everything will be made available, including the comments in the, the written chat and, and the oral comments. Uh, will that be possible? Another thing I would suggest is that uh, in the copy that is available to the general public after this event, that your scrolling text has numbers at the bottom of the page. If they're not going to be available, um, something should be done to add to them that the page from to which your comments are directed, because if we, without that, we will lose the context. And this is an extremely valuable meeting. I'm very distressed that uh, there aren't more people here. But if the recording is made available and all these details are included, it will certainly have served its purpose. And I just want to thank you for whatever you're doing to that end. Right. Well, we will indeed do nine other recordings. And what we did today, uh, my name is Jim Dingman. This is session one of a Project 2025 study group. Uh, today, we dealt with the introduction to page 87. And we're now going to talk about the Corporation for Public Broadcasting aspect of this. Now, um, <clears throat> what's not surprising or unsurprising in this is that it, um, and Michael, please chime in on this, because Michael brought this to uh, all of our attention. Uh, that they were mentioning the CPP and Pacifica in particular. Uh, it's no secret, you know, I've been a pretty keen student of media history uh, for many, many years. And it's no secret that uh, President Nixon, if he had been reelected and didn't have Watergate, he was going to knock out uh, the uh, National Public Radio, Public Broadcasting Service, and the CPB in a uh, new administration after 1972. Uh, they already had viewed NPR as a threat to the state. People forget that the first broadcast of NPR was on the May 1971 demonstrations in Washington, D.C. Uh, that were, you know, the subject of one of the greatest mass arrests in American history. Uh, and that was the introduction of NPR to the American public. And it also included uh, a number of people who had been uh, broadcasters at Pacifica. And that includes uh, uh, people who were at NPR for many years, at uh, people who were at BAI and other Pacifica stations. So it's not new that they want to knock out uh, the uh, uh, CPB. And uh, this particular part of the document is on page 245 to about 250, 260. And essentially it talks about uh, the elimination of bias and Here's a key phrase. Cutting off the CPB is logistically easy. Now, they've been trying to do this for years. All right. They tried to do it in 1994 against Pacifica when uh, Senator Pressler from, I believe, North Dakota or South Dakota, he led the charge against Pacifica. He actually asked 
that anybody who is NPR should declare if they worked for Pacifica in the past. Have you ever been a member of uh, Pacifica? And uh, and this is interesting because he obviously doesn't know that Pacifica doesn't get any money from the CPB, which amuses me. Yeah, he's not there. yeah de defunding the CPB would by no means cause NPR, PBS, or other public broadcasters that benefit from CPB funding, including even further to the left, Pacifica Radio and American Public Media to file for bankruptcy. All right. So they want to knock out the CPB. Now, what is even more pernicious? Uh, could you go back there for a second? Yeah, go on. Because I think it's critical. Uh, uh, as George Will wrote, if Sesame Street Republic would put up for auction, the danger would be of getting trampled by the stampede of potential bidders. What the, again, uh, what they're talking about is the privatization of public broadcasting. They want this, uh, any public broadcasting station. Later on, they talk about stripping the non-commercial educational licensing. That's not just the defunding. That, that's the critical thing because they want the stations to just compete in the marketplace for advertising dollars and for merchandising the content and, you know, rise and fall on that basis. It's about privatization and commercialization of, of every sphere of life. Now, the reason why George Will, I, I don't know what year they're referring to this piece by George Will, but <clears throat> in 1994, uh, there was a rebellion throughout the entire NPR PBS system. I was actually involved in working with people in New York City. Uh, people who I'd originally been fighting against at PBS. And they said, oh, well, let's let's bear the hatchet, Jim. We're going to cooperate. So every public television station and NPR station around the United States basically violated their charter. They're not supposed to sit there and lobby in front of the public. And they did. And what was the big theme? You're going to take Big Bird away from kids. So now you have Big Bird is on Sesame Street. I guess Sesame Street is on HBO right now. But here is the issue that uh, that uh, Michael just pointed out. They want to take away the non-commercial educational FM licenses from uh, NPR stations. They uh, at this point the FCC exempts NCHD, NCE licenses uh, stations from uh, licensing fees. They want to eliminate that, uh, and that of course would cause a problem for Pacifica because all the uh, signals, I believe, except for New York. Oh, no, Berkeley is also in the commercial Berkeley, zone. Yeah, yeah Berkeley, Berkeley and, and Ber New York. Yeah. Ber Berkeley is also in the commercial zone. But nevertheless, you know, who needs to spend extra money and resources? Uh, and the next president should instruct the FCC to exclude the stations affiliated with PBS and NPR from the NCE denomination and the privileges that come with it. So that is the uh, th that's just one little small part. I wouldn't even turn to the FCC issue because, trust me, that would take a tremendous amount of time to deal with because they're talking about eliminating uh, section, I think it's section 230 uh, that allows internet freedom, which is also a bipartisan target for both the Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill. And is, again, is quite controversial. But that is it. That's what I wanted to cover today. So any concluding comments from people about any of this, uh, anything that people who haven't said anything want to say about this? Thank you very much, Jim Dingman. This was wonderful. Well, thank you, Mar Marlena, Michael, Mark, uh, who haven't said anything. Mar I know Michael has. Uh, yeah, go on, Mike. Mike uh, yeah, thanks. Um, again, thank you very much for this. Um, I, I wanted to ask with regard to the um, what we were just talking about in the media um, re uh, regarding public broadcasting. Um, can Is this anything they can possibly only do through executive order, wouldn't they have to have congressional um, support in doing this? Or is it possible to do it through um, executive means? Uh, my answer to that question is I'd have to have the House and the Senate on their side yeah. to pull this off. And that's where uh, it's important. Like, look, at the national, at the, at the, uh, at the PNB a couple of weeks ago, we in an open session, we tried to pass a resolution about this, and it was essentially defeated. The argument was we have our own unitary sense of uh, direction going on in Pacifica right now. Uh, but uh, but anyway, they basically uh, put that aside. But it's an opportunity for Pacifica to align itself with all the different uh, NPR and PBS uh, stations in their local uh, community, because this will become an issue if, in fact, we see 
that Trump wins the White House in November of this year. And uh, I personally hope that doesn't happen. But uh, this is a serious threat that has to be taken into mind right now and offers us an opportunity to do things we should have been doing for a long time. And that is lobby with our congressional uh, district, uh, congressional delegations uh, in our metro areas and our state legislative uh, delegations. And they can, of course, help us. Uh, and uh, this is something I've always wanted to see us do. And we, that whole thing fell apart uh, back in the early 1990s. Michael, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, they specifically talk about the fact that uh, going back to Nixon, that they tried to defund the CPB and were, and were uh, frustrated by the fact that there was effective lobbying to Congress to maintain the funding and that they, the president has to figure out how to overcome that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, because of what you're showing here about the U.S. AGM, the Alliance for Global Media, that's uh, Radio Free Europe, so-called Voice of America, Radio Marti. This is all the propaganda efforts. And, I, you know, again, this has to do with the, uh, there is a division between the hard right and, and the people who are pushing this and other aspects of U.S. imperial domination. But we should recognize that a lot of the people who currently control the CPB and the FCC come out of that same nexus. They come out of Voice mm. of America, they come out mm. of Radio Marti. And uh, that's who's in charge, even under, you know, quote unquote, liberal uh, administrations. So, uh, you know, that's why I think we have to have an independent. I mean, I don't disagree with, with trying to build alliances with NPR and, and, and uh, uh, PBS in, in terms of lobbying. But I think we should also recognize that, uh, you know, we're, we're confronting more than just the right when we're dealing with this. We have to think about. You know, again, the, they, they emphasize the continuity. Uh, I'll just repeat that. They're, they're aware that there is, a, I don't want to call it a deep state, but there's a permanent state apparatus that functions uh, whoever's in charge, uh, you know, at the White House. And they're trying to grapple with that contradiction uh, because they're pushing the really hard right uh, uh, strategy and, and tactics that, you know, uh, other elements don't agree with. But uh, I think we have we have a, a, a different and independent course to chart. Absolutely, and I think uh, while we I believe a popular front approach is the best way to handle this, and I also think that we should strengthen our ability and alliances with alternative media organizations throughout the country at you know grassroots radio conference. But frankly, all the social media organizations that are going to be attacked by the Republicans uh, coming forward because they're going to do a serious attack on internet neutrality uh, if they, and I think that's a bipartisan attack that's going to happen. It is a bipartisan attack happening and that'll affect everybody. Now, um, does anybody else have any comments before we uh, adjourn for today? Uh, uh, Jim, uh, just yes, one Jack. comment that kind of, kind of keeps banging around in my head. Uh, the, uh, the vicious cycle, the negative, uh, 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 inducement for people to take the money in the United States Congress has 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 uh, strangled our country from doing anything, anything about migration, uh, uh, immigration, anything about energy, oil companies, anything about the climate, anything about you know, uh, uh, it, it's just a model that's not working anymore. And so, if if you could get money out of the Congress, <laughs> uh, I, I know what we're doing is different than that because what they're doing is they're talking about taking over the the uh, uh, the space uh, 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 of of the country where people can actually uh, uh, make uh, movements forward uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, as uh, uh, Bob Henley calls it the stuck nation. Our nation's been stuck for fifty years. We're 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 constantly sending money to elite people. We're constantly helping corporations screw us. And uh, if the people in the flyover states, as was said before, are angry about that, they're picking the wrong uh, horse in this race because the guy that uh, basically uh, tells them what's wrong with them uh, and he's going to fix it, as was said before, is not fixing anything. He's just basically going along with the, uh, mm. the elite telling us that it's it's our fault that we're uh, we're stuck. So uh, I believe getting money out of Congress, uh, if overturning the, uh, uh, the what is Citizens United, uh, uh, re 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 uh, reorganizing the Supreme Court, so you don't have uh, 
uh, people taking bribes from wealthy people. <laughs> I think all of this is kind of like a part and parcel of what I believe nowadays, because I don't really see our country going any further, except, you know, just saying, oh, we don't know what to ha we don't know what to do about China. We don't know what to do about uh, COVID. We don't know what to do about this because we have so many different people and they claim it's their freedom to have, you know, uh, an AK, an AR-15 or an AK-47. This is not freedom, folks. This is... Uh, it's 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 depressing that it's so self defeating. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Well, I have relatives who support Trump, and I argue with them incessantly. As you know, I do too. And, and I have and I have and I have relatives who I persuaded who will apologize for me for voting for Trump in 2016. So, uh, and I have relatives who have virtual arsenals that they own. So I'm very familiar with the Second Amendment issue and how that works out, but. Uh, it is important. Uh, I've always had a problem with how the organized left uh, in the United States, going back to the 60s, uh, had difficulties dealing with the working class in general. And I think that I don't again, that's a discussion for another time. Uh, Claire or Mark or Marlena, uh, anybody who hasn't uh, mentioned anything or said anything so far or had said things but haven't said it uh, recently. Do you guys want to have any final comments? Uh, no, yes. just uh, I sorry, just thank you. F and to everybody, Jim, for you for putting this together, but also for everyone's very, very thoughtful approach to this. I, I, I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Claire. And hopefully we'll have more people on. And um, Mark, you have any comments? No, just thank you for for doing this and um, just how scary this uh, would be if uh, implemented. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Marlena, do you have any comments? All right, I guess Marlena doesn't. Okay. All right. So, Jean, uh, Jim, please. Yes, go on, Carolyn. Um, I'm asking again that this be made available, this particular session, with all the comments and um, public and, and um, in writing also. Is yeah. It going to be done? Uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. I'm going to send it off to Michael, but I have other places I'm going to put these uh, – Mm -hmm. uh right now uh, there's a website i'm doing uh pot with podcasts so maybe i'll send it over there and let people know where that is so they can come because you know we're going to go through the whole goddamn document so uh you know fasten your seat belts anyway michael go on michael thank you mike bresler oh, um thanks i i just want to re-emphasize what he said i think in a way what um uh we got to think of is an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and whether or not we are in the same boat and uh, we're not necessarily in the same boat as um you know the mainstream democratic party let's say but it's you know th this kind of um is the time for at least um making strange bedfellows you know to prevent some uh uh, some serious uh, things from happening. That's Thank it. you, Mike. Uh, I should add that I know I will be working uh, to help downstate politicians be elected um, in terms of uh, phone calls. You know, I definitely will probably be mobilized to make phone calls into Pennsylvania, etc. And I don't mind that. I really don't mind arguing with people who support Trump. I've done that before. I actually was trained to do that in the last election, I went into Pennsylvania several times, had a lot of fun uh, with the uh, pro-Trump people because, uh, you know, I'm a little bit of redneck myself, so I can sort of deal with them. But in any event, I want to thank everybody for coming to repeat what we did today. This is session one of a series of uh, seminars, talk shows. Uh, one can figure out what kind of synthesis to give to a Zoom talk. But we're going to be looking at the entire Project 2025 document today. We handled the first part of the book and the part of the book that deals with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The part of the book we handled was their designs and ideas for the executive branch of government. And we will further look into this as time goes on. I welcome people to look and uh, see the different kinds of uh, literature out there on this subject. It is vast. And I will invite people who have expertise on China in particular. Uh, I have a friend of mine who is completing a uh, seven-year fellowship at Harvard and Princeton. 
and I will ask Aaron to come and participate with us to talk about China. That's his area of expertise, uh, China. And this will be fun for him because he's not done. He's sort of transitioning into the policy world, but uh, this will sort of uh, be interesting for Aaron to come and talk to a group of people uh, and deal with the question of China. He just was in Beijing for about a month, came back. He actually had an article in Foreign Affairs uh, recently on Chinese foreign policy in the Middle East. So I will ask Aaron to participate and share his opinions with us. And I want to bid everybody a good day. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and again, the next time we do this will be this coming Tuesday, uh, July 30th. Uh, it'll be pages 87 through 153. Uh, and uh, let's see what happens. Thank you again and have a great day.